Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Um, just really quick, I know we're a little bit late here, but I just wanted to, to thank you before I start here. I just wanted to thank each and every one of you um, for the encouragement that you and you shared with me and my family with the passing of my mom back in February. So words cannot convey how grateful we are for each and every one of uh, each of you in our lives and just wanted to say thank you. Thank you so very, very much. Okay. Uh, please rise as we turn to Proverbs 3. Proverbs 3, verses 1 through 12. <coughs> my son, do not forget my teaching. Okay. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord from your, from your wealth and from the first fruit of your produce, first of your produce. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. My son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord or loathe his reproof. For whom the Lord loves, he reproves even as a father corrects the son in whom he delights. You may be seated. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you will open each of our ears and hearts to receive the message that you have prepared for each of us this evening. I pray for the worship team, and I thank you for blessing us e week after week with their music and songs. I pray for Pastor Andrew, and thank you for his hard work in preparing for this week's evening service. He, too, is a blessing for each of us every week. Thank you for Pastor Andy and for the elders and deacons and for all the servants that sacrifice so joy joyfully to bless each of us. Lord, I personally do not know what each of your children are going through or dealing with, but dear Heavenly Father, you most certainly do. You know which person is suffering physically or which person may be suffering a different way, for there are many ways of hurting. I pray, Lord, that, you, that we would put off the questions, uncertainties, fears, and problems of the days ahead and see only you and you glorified. You have not said that this life would be easy and trouble-free, but instead you have promised to be with each of us as we face the difficulties of each day. The days ahead appear dark and uncertain, but there have been dark days before. Men, women, nations, and leaders come and go, but Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Please help each of us to put on our faith in you and you alone. Finally, Lord, I pray that if there is someone here who may not know you or may not have put their faith in you, that, that they would be humbled this evening. I pray that their hearts would be broken as they contemplate the bad choices they've made. I pray that they would see the ugliness of their sins and how their choices are leading directly to destruction. That this life is but a vapor and they must face either judgment or mercy. You offer the free gift of salvation, free to us, but so costly to you. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you for the cross. Thank you that I do not have to pay for the choices and sins committed in my life because, Lord, Jesus paid it all. Amen. Let us sing praise to our God who is a help in times of trouble. May our hope be in Christ. May we have joy in trials knowing that whatever the pathway we may walk, God is with us, and in the end, we will be with him. Please stand and lift your voices in song. Yeah. 
My rock and my redeemer, greatest treasure of my longing soul. My God, like you, there is no other. True delight is found in you. Rock 
in many ways. You are you're glorified in victory and triumph. Lord, when your word goes forth and we see much fruit, Lord, we see people saved and added to the church. Lord, you are glorified when we are in the midst of hardship. Lord, when maybe we even sense that there are not many that stand with us, yet we are abiding in Christ. Lord, we are standing firm in the truth. Lord, when the evil one, Lord, and those who may be his come against us, come against you. Lord, we, you are glorified when we hold that shield against those darts, when we stand firm, Lord, in the gospel of peace. Lord, when we put on your helmet of salvation, Lord, we remember whose we are. So, Lord, in all things and all ways, whether it would be as we would say good things or bad things, easy things or hard things, Lord, may we be yours and live as yours that you may be glorified. Lord, and we thank you that there is purpose in trials. Lord, you are at work in us, maturing us. Lord, causing us to endure. Lord, you are purifying us in your church that we might shine all the more brightly in this darkened world. Lord, so use us, grow us, refine us. Lord, be glorified in us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. it there. There we are. Grace and peace, brothers and sisters. It's very good to be back with you tonight. As you know, last week, last Sunday night, or if you didn't get the memo, <laughs> sorry, uh, last Sunday night we weren't here, but the church was gathering. We were in Ripon for the family launch, as they call it, the family launch of Christ Community Church Ripon. How many of you were able to go to that? Raise your hand. That was really special, wasn't it? And I just kept thinking, we got to do this again real soon. Uh, that, that was a, a blessing to be a part of, to have the church, the local church down there, Kingsburg come up and us and them. And it, it was just really sweet. And uh, we need go good, solid churches around. We need those that are existing churches to be solid, to, to preach the word. But sometimes we need solid churches to be planted. So that was really special for me to be a part of. Uh, and uh, The week before that, I was not with you, and so I do want to say thank you to Lance Nelson for preaching to you, preaching from 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Uh, s encouragement for suffering citizen. Uh, I had him preach for me, or as you heard the story, Andy said, are you on? And he said, I'm on, I'm ready. Uh, but I was down in Long Beach. Many of you were praying for, for us as we went down there. Those of you who don't know, my parents are looking to move out of the house where they've lived for 40 years. They moved there in April of 1980, and I was born September of 1980. So that's the one. <laughs> that's the one house. So we went down there, all my brothers and sisters, that is. I'm the youngest of four. We converged on their house, and all Saturday we were cleaning up and deciding what to store, what to pack, what to give away, and that sort of thing, and just to get their house ready to sell. And so it does have a buyer now, and they're in process with that, uh, looking to move uh, just down the road, about five miles locally. Uh, but uh, I love that house. I grew up in that house, and it was hard for me to leave that. Uh, but on Monday when Kim and I we were... Uh, 
getting ready to leave and come back home, we were on the driveway with my parents, and we were just praying, just praying and thanking the Lord for his goodness through that edifice, that location there. And uh, I attempted to, to lead us in singing, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And we choked through that one. Boy, that was, that was tough. That was really tough. But the Lord helped me to see that that house, that location where my parents have had 40 years of their marriage, where they've raised their children and grandchildren for the past 40 years, that's a, an example of God's faithfulness. God has been faithful, and he provided for them, for me, through that home. And he'll provide in the future. So we can leave that behind and just be grateful and say thank you and uh, just continue to look to him. So for those of you who did pray, I really appreciate it. And you know how you say we felt the prayers. I don't know what that is. It's not biblical, I don't think. But there's something there. <laughs> just got to say there's something there. So I appreciate your prayers. Uh, it went very smoothly, but it was very difficult at the same time because of all the emotional uh, sentimental attachments. So thank you for that. So I do say truly that it is a privilege to be back up here with you. Tonight is our current affair and prayer service. And we're going to be looking at Christian persecution in North America. Subtitle is Canadian Pastor James Coates in Prisons. Please take out your Bibles and turn with me to Revelation chapter 2, verse 25. The beginning of Revelation, as you know, contains seven specific letters to seven churches. And these letters, while they address specifics, they're also applicable to us, so they're also timeless. But Revelation 2, verse 25, Jesus says some very sober and serious words. Look at it there. This is to the church, his church at Thyatira. Thyatira. He says in verse 25, Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. Hold fast until I come. As I said, those are serious and sober words. That phrase, hold fast, is somewhat of a motto amongst the letters to these seven churches because it's used three times. If you look at Revelation 2.13, Jesus spoke this as a commendation to his church at Pergamum when he says, I know, he says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name and didn't deny my faith. And then in Revelation 3, 11, it's an exhortation to the church at Philadelphia, and he says, I am coming quickly, hold fast what you you have. So again, to Thyatira, he says, hold fast until I come. Jesus' words here contain two parts. Basically, they are an exhortation, hold fast, but also an expectation until I come. There is a command but then also he speaks of his coming. Or we could say there is a precept, hold fast. And there is next a promise, until I come. So that's a beautiful little phrase for us. And just as it was Jesus Christ's words to his church at Thyatira, they are also Jesus Christ's words to his church at Hickman. Hold fast, Hickman. Until he comes. The phrase there, hold fast, it means to continue in faithfulness. Continue in faithfulness to the teaching. Sometimes Paul uses the word tradition. He's not talking about made up tradition. He's talking about that which was taught and has been handed down. That message that has not changed. It's become a tradition in that non-Roman Catholic sense. It is the truth. And you hold fast to that teaching. And so we are to hold fast to our Christian confession and our Christian profession. One commentator said to follow Jesus faithfully is to continue to keep on keeping on. Hold on to what you have. 
grow in maturity, grow in the faith and the, and the love and the perseverance that you're already living in until Jesus comes to claim you as his own. Dear Saint, we are told to hold fast like a rock climber who's clinging onto the side of a mountain as he makes his ascent to the top. We cling to Christ. We cling to his truth. And so thus, King Jesus says to his church here at Hickman, hold fast until I come. Now the call to hold fast must therefore imply within, it that, that, within that that something's wrong, potentially. Hold fast must imply that there's some reason or some pressure that we might be tempted not to hold fast, not to cling to God's truth. Well, this idea of holding fast is becoming greater and greater in our day. There's a greater and greater need for it because there's pressure to compromise. There's always pressure to compromise, but I think you and I feel it. There's more and more pressure. The world seems to be changing, or in fact, the world seems to be showing is really what it is. <laughs> the world seems to be showing more and more, and so there's more of a pressure to compromise. And so that's why one of the reasons Lance uh, chose his text from 2 Thessalonians, and he wanted to give encouragement for suffering citizens. And he asked all of you a few weeks ago, are you prepared to be canceled for Christ? Or worse, he said worse too, but that's an interesting statement. It's very re relevant for our society. Are we prepared for that? It's no shock to you when I say that the, the Christianity in the New Testament is very much a, a religion that is surrounded by persecution and suffering and hardship. 11 out of Paul's 13 letters, 11 out of Paul's 13 letters mention his, his suffering, his persecution, and his hardship. Titus doesn't, and 1 Timothy doesn't. But the rest of those mention his hardships for the gospel. In fact, he writes in his final letter in 2 Timothy 3, 12, he says, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. There's no other way around it. So just as Lance probed the topic of suffering as a Christian, so I want to continue that same idea and ask similar questions of you. Are you prepared to persevere and hold fast to Christian truth? Are you prepared to be persecuted because you're holding fast to Christian truth? And will you take Jesus' command seriously to hold fast until he comes? Well, as I said tonight, this is our current affair and prayer service. And so I do want to talk to you about a specific persecution issue that's taking place. And I included us in there by saying North America, as if to say this is not far from us. This is just on the other side of our northern border. Canadian pastor James Coates has been in prison since February the 16th. So it's over a month now. Some have said that the government there where he is in Edmonton wants to make an example of him. And I want to do that tonight as well, because the brother's holding fast. He's holding fast, and we can take encouragement from him. So let me just break down for you the story in case you're not familiar with it. I'll give a timeline as well, uh, and, uh, and then we'll talk about some prayer requests, as we like to do on these current affairs uh, nights. So Pastor James Coates, who's a pastor in Canada, he's been imprisoned specifically for going against COVID restrictions. That's what this is related to. This is related to COVID restrictions by presiding over his church uh, during corporate worship. So he is the pastor of a church called Grace Life Church in Alberta, Canada. And as I said, he was jailed February 16th, and he remains there, and he's waiting for a second trial for May 3rd. Now, there's other details that I can give to you, but uh, he was also, uh, he had a first trial and he was denied uh, bail or so they wouldn't, there were some other uh, stipulations that they wouldn't let him out, but then he has another trial date set for May 3rd. So currently his wife and his two boys are prohibited from visiting him. Now, what's interesting about James Coates is he's actually a student of the, a uh, graduate of the Master Seminary, and he was actually in my Greek class. So I know the brother, he would know me, but I, we weren't friends necessarily, uh, but we, we took the same class. Actually, he was, um, he was also on facilities, Andy, just uh, after you, after your time. 
uh, but he's been there at the church where he is, Grace Life, since 2010. So here's the timeline of what's gone down. So Grace Life suspended corporate worship services in the spring of 2020, just like everybody else. On June 21st, they came back to uh, corporate gatherings. Early in July, two people in their church had COVID, so they took two weeks shut down, similar to what we did, uh, but then they came back. In December of 2020, the chief medical officer of Alberta issued a mandate restricting worship gatherings to 15% capacity with masks and social distancing. In November, Canadian health officials began showing up at Grace Life worship gatherings, recording the number of attendees. So this is actually before the the December uh, mandate. So for about three months, though, health officials in Canada were coming into the church. Uh, December 17th, the health inspector posted a report against the church. On January 21st, a court order was filed to imprison Pastor Coates. That's January of this year. On January 29th, the health department issued a closure order, but the church continued to gather for corporate worship. Then on February the 7th, after the morning worship service, two Royal Canadian Mounted Police officers met with Pastor Coates and a few others in his office at the church and told Pastor Coates that he was under arrest for continuing to preside over worship gatherings, explaining that he must abide by the health order. That is, he could only hold church if he followed all the health restrictions, 15% uh, capacity, and so on. But Pastor James explained that he could not go against his conscience and he needed to shepherd God's people. The police left at that point without arresting him on February 7th. February 14th, that's the next Sunday, they decide to gather again because, of course, Jesus Christ sets the dictates of what we do. (laughs) So they meet again on February 14th. Now, let me just ask you, if you were told you can't meet, and then that next Sunday you needed to speak at a gathering, let's say, what do you think you might preach? What text might you choose if you were chosen to speak? And you've already been put on notice. Where do you think you would go? Well, Pastor James Coates, as you may know already, went for the jugular. He went for the right text. He went to Romans 13. Romans 13 is usually titled the believer's relationship to the government. But the way he preached it, which is in the text, he preached it as the government's responsibility to God or the government's abilities under God. So his message was directly to the Canadian authorities. That's bold. But it was the right place to go. Because as he said in his message, who else will tell the government their role? God instituted the government, we believe, in Genesis chapter 9. So who else is going to tell them what they can and cannot do? So on that Sunday, he preached, and Andy actually recommended that. I don't know if you heard that. He recommended that you find that sermon and you watch it. Uh, You can find it on YouTube. It's got over 100,000 views. So on Monday, February 14th, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police asked Pastor Coates to attend the RCMP station. That's the police station. (coughs) When he arrived, they charged him with multiple Public Health Act offenses and a criminal offense related to the bail condition that they imposed on February the 7th. And then so I'm told that it was the next day, actually February 16th, that he was arrested and jailed and has been in the Edmonton Remand Center after he refused to sign a bail condition. And again, that bail condition required him to effectively promise to, exer- to stop exercising his charter freedoms, which is, this is Canada we're talking about, his charter freedoms of conscience, religion, expression, association, and peaceful assembly. So this was an issue for him. He will not defy the Lord Jesus Christ and his orders. Some have said this reminds of John Bunyan, who once said, I will stay in jail to the end of my days before I make a butchery of my conscience. Pastor James says, I'm not going to do that. So now, let me just say something, uh, just interject this. 
as Christians have heard about this and thought through this, some have said, you know what? Right on. He's, you know, he's suffering. He's being persecuted for Christ's sake. Other Christians have said, you know what? He didn't need to do that. He didn't need to keep on doing this. He could have been a faithful Christian and not have done this. And so some have said that actually this doesn't count as actual persecution. Now, whether or not you agree with him, the decision he made is, as someone said, was a biblically permissible decision. He's not outside of biblical bounds. Maybe you would choose to do something different, but we should not fault him. Is it the same as John Bunyan or others? Probably not, but he's standing up for the truth. So since he's been in prison, his wife, Erin, uh, she has been quite bold as well. I don't know if you've seen her on Instagram. She has an Instagram account. How many of you, let me just raise, just raise your hand. How many of you followed her on Instagram? Yeah, she said this recently. She says, this has been hard for me. Our whole marriage, I have taken care of him, and now I can't. My care for him has taken on a different face in this season. I know this is what we need to grow in further dependence on Christ. As Steve Lawson said in his hashtag non-shepherds conference message two weeks ago, I supply the weakness, he supplies the power. We are learning contentment. Please pray for James. The enemy appears to attack him extra hard on Sundays. He longs to be with us. Not having fellowship for four weeks and potentially until the middle of May is hard. Even the Apostle Paul was able to have visitors. She writes, but that's his wife. So on March 17th, all over the news, they were saying that the crown prosecutors were going to withdraw all but one, all but one of the Public Health Act offenses that James had been charged with. So it was expected that Pastor James could be released from jail as early as Friday, March 19th. That's last Friday. But he's not out of prison yet. That has not happened. So Aaron did note in her Instagram account that James's hearing won't be until Monday morning, the 22nd at 9.30 a.m. That's tomorrow morning. And so at that time, there, he's going to go before a judge, and there'll be something called a joint submission. And one article said, while it's highly likely that the judge will accept it, it's important to note that it's not guaranteed or a foregone conclusion. While it would be very rare, it is not without precedent that the judge could refuse to accept the joint submission and keep James incarcerated until his trial in May or until he accepts the conditions that prohibit him from stepping foot on church property. And all God's people here said, ain't gonna happen, right? He won't do that, I don't believe. So what do we make of this? As you've perhaps heard of this before, or maybe for the first time tonight, wh what do you make of this? Well, we can see that this is about religious liberty, the freedom to worship. And religious liberty is in peril in Canada. We would also say this is about, this is about the essential nature of gathered worship. <laughs> it's about religious liberty, but it's also freedom of worship. This is about Hebrews 10.25. This is also about faithfulness to God. And so Pastor James Coates is willing to pay the price. And as we look at that faithful brother, we look at ourselves in the mirror, and we also ask the question, am I willing? Would I be willing to pay such a price? <coughs> so this, let's look at our response now. As I said, could you be willing to pay this price? But let me just say a couple of things. This is in Canada, but this is coming to America. This is the future. Now, right now, or for the past number of years, we'd really, we've lived in prosperity and, and pleasure, but that's pretty much an anomaly. Even as Pastor James said in his last sermon for Romans 13, he says, we've had it so good for so long. And as Pastor John Piper says that we are living in this Disneyland called America. We don't experience what New Testament believers or many believers around the majority of the world have or are experiencing. But it seems like things are changing. Thing, things are, 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 are changing for what's going on here and, and, and the freedoms that we do enjoy. So it seems that the pressure 
is starting to increase, and it seems that persecution is on the horizon. Well, Jesus says to his church in Hickman, hold fast. (laughs) I wonder, will you be considered a rebel in 2021? One pastor posted this on Twitter. He said, how to be a rebel in 2021. Here's a few ideas. Ready? Believe the Bible. Embrace your God-given gender. Reject all sexual perversion as sin. Get married, remain faithful. Have many children. Teach your children. Go to church joyfully. Live all of life for God's glory. That's what it is to be a rebel in 2021. Hold fast. John MacArthur said, the only times the church has made any significant impact on the world are when the people of God have stood firm, refused to compromise, and boldly proclaimed the truth despite the world's hostility. We must not compromise. We must hold fast. And as I told you in Jesus' words there in Revelation 2.25, there is a command but it also speaks of his coming. There's a precept, but there's also a promise. And the promise is, until I come. Jesus says, I am coming back. Our head is coming back. Our captain, our king, will arrive. Now remember, Second Peter says our Lord is patient, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. And so that means in the meantime, we must wait, but we must also follow his orders and we must hold fast. He is our hope as well as our head. He will come at last. The bridegroom will come for his bride. The hero will come to rescue. He's coming. He is coming. I was asking myself as I was thinking through this, what is it that you are waiting for? What is it that I'm waiting for? What is it that you're looking forward to? Jesus says, hold fast until I come. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. We must be mindful of that. We must not let the prosperity or or the privileges that we do enjoy in this country blind us or shield us or hinder us from recognizing the greatest reality and the greatest joy of our lives, and that is that Jesus Christ is coming. John Piper said, God is not a killjoy. God kills what kills our joy. (laughs) He's about our joy, and he's about our joy in him. Dear friend, if you reject him when he comes back, he comes in wrath. But if you have received him when he returns, he will rescue you. You whom he has already ransomed through the cross, he will rescue you. Again, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. I know that I want him to find me working for him when he comes. I want him to find me watching for him, waiting for him, working, working for him, looking for him, alert and not asleep, engaged, not disengaged. I want to be found not on the sidelines, but in the front of the charge. How about you, dear friend? Hold fast until he comes. We must not waver. We must not give up. We must not compromise. As Steve Lawson said recently, I see a storm gathering. So dear friends, we must heed our Lord's words to us in Hickman. Hold fast until I come. Well, as I said, we want to mention some prayer requests and lift up some requests before the Lord tonight. And so in just a moment, Daryl and Andy are going to to come up and, and lead us in these requests, but I wanted to share them with you. I have 10. The first five are these. Of course, we need to pray for James Coates. We need to pray for James Coates. He's under pressure right now. Uh, As we can look at him and say, wow, that's great. You've done so good. I mean, he probably is glad for that and, and feels the joy of obedience, but it doesn't mean the pressure is off. 
it could mean that the pressure is increased because now he's Mark. Now he's the guy. Now he's whatever. There's going to be more pressure on him. So we need to pray for his perseverance. We need to pray for his relief as well. Paul said in Colossians 4.18 in the ESV, remember my chains. Hebrews 13.3 says, remember the prisoners as though in prison with them. And you remember they prayed for Peter in Acts 12, 5. And it says, so Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. That's what I intend for us to do tonight for our brother. We also need to pray for his wife, Aaron. Uh, Think of what's going on in her heart and mind emotionally. She hinted at it and she said things on Instagram. uh, But she's missing a husband. And this has got to be hard for her. So we need to pray for her and her encouragement. Also pray for her testimony. She's been very vocal. And I don't know if you saw it, but she was on Tucker Carlson, I think Thursday night or Tuesday night or one of those. And she had an interview with Tucker Carlson. And uh, she's very outspoken and she's very bold. Uh, So we need to pray for her to continue to be bold for Christ in all these different ways. We need to pray for their children. They have two boys. I know that Aaron said that they've been on an emotional roller coaster. You know, where's daddy? Can we see him? Yes, you can see him. Oh, no, you can't see him. Why can't we see him? You know, and they, and they think they've been Zooming or Skyping or whatever at different times. So that's helpful. But it's got to be hard for them. You see the picture of them up there. Uh, we need to pray for the church, Grace Life Edmonton, and their elders. Pray that the elders have wisdom. They make wise decisions. That they continue to protect the church because looky lose will come now. And that church is probably bursting as they gather. And so who's coming? Maybe faithful people that are hurting and they want ministry. But also maybe people are just looking for something where they can stir up and cause trouble. So we need to pray for the church. We also need to pray for Canadian authorities. Paul says in 1 Timothy 2, we need to pray for uh, kings and all who are in authority that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. So we need to pray for those authorities there as well Uh, another group of five if you go to the next slide we need to be praying for the strengthening of faithful pastors at this time yeah we need to pray that that faithful pastors will be strengthened and i guess i should say we need to pray that unfaithful pastors will will either leave or become faithful pastors that's what we want in god's church god wants faithful men so we need to pray for them we need to pray also for parents to raise children who are willing to live and die for Christ. Parents, are you raising your children with that in mind? It's all too easy for us to say, I just want to raise children who will be happy little Christians living happy little lives. And they get their degree, and they have their picket fence, and they just continue the flow here. Well, we need to pray me, for you, for parents, that you raise children who will be willing to live and die for Christ. Both, of course, as you know, are essential. We need to pray for student ministries that won't just be about pizza parties and beach balls, but that student ministries, particularly Doxa and Impact, that they would raise up disciples that are willing to live and die for Christ. It says in Revelation 2.10, be faithful until death. Those are Jesus' words to that particular church there. Be faithful until death. Not all of us will be martyrs, but all of us need to be faithful. You know, when you think of GOG or the Adventure Club or VBS or DOXA or Impact, I think you know this, but let me just remind you, we're not playing games. We play games. <laughs> but it's not just game time. <laughs> the, the, especially the student ministry staff that I get to serve with, they are so eager and zealous for our teenagers. And you students in the back corner, we want to see you raised up by God to be faithful, where you would say, I will die for Christ, but first I will live for Christ. That's what we are about here at this local church, and that's what we want to see in your life. And we hope that God does that. Yeah, God's got to do it. But you've got to be faithful with what he's, he's given to you as well. Number nine, 
pray for yourself. <laughs> Paul asked for prayers, remember, in Colossians 4? Pray for yourself. Pray that you, you will be faithful. One blogger said, before James Coates' courageous public act of faith, he must have made many courageous private acts of faith. He said, private obedience to God precedes public obedience to God. Private courage precedes public courage. So pray for yourself. Pray that the Lord will protect you. Colossians 1 is a great prayer. 1 verses 10 through 11, the whole prayer you can, you can say, but you can say, Lord, help me to walk in a manner worthy of you, O Lord, to please you in every respect, being filled with, uh, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of you, strengthened with all power according to your glorious might. Help me to be steadfast and patient. Ask God to strengthen you and to purify you. I, I recently read J.C. Ryle's book. It's called Five English Reformers, and all of them were burned at the stake. And it's really encouraging to read of uh, stories of martyrs it gives you a sense on the one hand of what's really important here. These men were willing to give themselves up here to serve the church, and then it cost them their life, and they're willing to do it. I've heard it said that the Puritans read to their children two books, well, three books, the Bible, Pilgrim's Progress, and Fox's Book of Martyrs. You ever read Fox's Book of Martyrs? It does something to you. It, it gets down to the nitty-gritty. It gets, gets you down to, hey, wh wh what am I doing here? What is this all about? What is this all for? So I encourage you, pray for yourself. Ask the Lord that he would strengthen you and sober you if you're not sober in the things that your life is all about. And number 10, pray that God would use for good what Satan intends for evil. And even as I write this prayer, some of you might be thinking, oh yeah, it's Genesis 50, 20, it was Joseph. The Lord does that. Yes, the Lord does that. And so we want to ask and we want to make prayers in line with what God wants to do. If we ask according to his will, John records, he hears us. We know jailers can get saved. We know inmates can repent. We know brothers and sisters can be made more bold and encouraged when a brother is in prison. So please pray as well that God would use this uh, for his ultimate good and glory. That it would be just sweet. That it would, it, believers would rejoice, that people would repent and, and be saved. We know that Satan will not have the last word, and we pray that he will not have the last word on these things. So as I said, I've asked Daryl and Andy if they would come up and pray in these chunks. So if you men want to come up in church, you'll join us in praying with these men. Thank you, brother. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Our God of grace, we know that living in this dark and sinful world, that those who preach truth, that those who exalt God and preach Christ and him crucified will be hated <coughs> by the world because it first hated Jesus. Without cause, dear Heavenly Father. Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake. We see what is happening to the church, dear Heavenly Father, and we cannot close our eyes in blindness that it may come to our doorstep one of these days. But only in Jesus may we find the peace in times of tribulation, because he has overcome the world and we will overcome the world. There is nothing new under the sun. We, <coughs> excuse me, we know that, that men, the prophets of the Old Testament, were persecuted. We know that the men, the apostles of the New Testament, were persecuted. Peter was thrown into prison and told when he is released not to mention the name of Christ, but as he went out, he preached Christ. We know that Paul spent many days in, in prison, in stocks, 
receiving lashes, but he never wavered from standing strong in the truth. John was sent to the island of Patmos for standing strong in the faith. So I have some prayer requests, Heavenly Father, that I would like to raise up to you tonight. I pray for Pastor James Coates for boldly preaching your word. I pray for him to find comfort in you and you alone, dear God. I pray for his wife, Erin. I pray for her bold confession of Christ. I pray for her trust in you. I pray that she would not waver, that she would guide and lead her children, dear Heavenly Father. I pray for their children, young children that may not quite hardly understand what is going on with their father, but I pray that you would strengthen them in this time. And for the church, dear Heavenly Father, for uh, Life Church, Grace Life Church in Edmonton, California, Canada, I pray, dear Lord, that the elders would stand strong, that, that they would not waver to an easy path, but they would trust in you with all their heart and not lean on their own understanding, that they would bring you glory and praise. And within our own church, we have suffering. We have not been at the point of much persecution, dear Heavenly Father, but we do have those in our church that I would like to raise up tonight that are suffering, some with bodily injuries or sicknesses. I pray for Jackie Comfort who is battling the battle of cancer and has had chemo and radiation. Yet her and John, I still saw at church this morning, and she is blessed because she can come here and worship. I pray for Jerry Morgan, who has gone under quite a trial um, with a viral infection, dear Heavenly Father. But he has been patient, he has trusted in you, and he is well on the way to recovery. And I pray that he continues to struggle that way. I pray for Patty Ecker, who suffered a stroke, dear Heavenly Father, who is improving somewhat. And you are to do the glory for all of that. And I pray for our church. I pray for our church to be men and women of prayer for all who are in heaven. I mean, in prison, excuse me for preaching the truth of your word. I pray that they would stand behind their pastors and their elders, but most of all, that they would stand for you, Lord. I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that we would pray for the Canadian authorities that naturally try to appease and walk in the way of this world. But I pray, dear Lord, that you would make it evident, evident to them, as you have to us, dear God, that we may know the truth and that they may see the truth of a man standing steadfast in Jesus Christ. May we not forget that our, your strength is sufficient for us and your power is made evident in our weakness. Our hope is not in man, but it is in God. Heavenly Father, I know you know and hear the prayers of your saints. So I pray that we would pray steadfastly, that we would truly be men and women of prayer for your glory, for your praise in all things. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Father, as we continue to pray tonight, we set our minds and our hearts and our thoughts upon you, because Lord, our hope comes from you. You are the sovereign God and ruler of this universe. And Father, there is nothing that happens in this world but that which, Lord, you have ordained and purposed. So we come to you and thank you, Father, for, for the glory for the wisdom, for the knowledge, for 
the truth that you have revealed to us of yourself. It's to know you that we exist, Lord. You have made yourself known to us, but Father, for us to know you and to come humbly towards you and to bow before you and to worship you, Father, this changes everything. This changes our hearts. This changes what we long for, what we desire, what we choose, what we suffer for. So, Father, we pray that you would strengthen us, Lord, that you would strengthen faithful and make faithful pastors across this great land. Lord, so many are giving up on the truth. So many are holding to the the wisdom of men and the doctrines of demons. Father, they're ashamed of the truth and ashamed of the gospel. Lord, may we never be that. Father, we pray for men in this area. We pray for the pulpits in Stanislaus County and Waterford and Hickman and Hewson. Father, we pray that you would raise up faithful men, faithful pastors. For, Lord, you will build your church. And we pray for men who would be unflinching with the truth, who would hold to the inerrant truth, authoritative and sufficient word of God and not deviate from it. Father, we pray for mums and dads in this great land who are facing all kinds of issues, whose children, as, even as I talked this week with, with a brother in this church, where children are now exposed to so many things. And it's so hard, Lord, for parents today to guide and govern and direct their children. When the world is invading every space it possibly can. And I pray for parents in this church and in this area, Lord, that would would stand firm, that would, would not allow the evil one to access their children's minds, that they would raise their children in the discipline and the instruction of you, Lord, that they would fill their kids' minds and hearts with, with things that are heavenly, things that, are, that Father, are, are going to impact and direct their children for eternity. Father, I pray for parents that they would pray and seek your face that they would lay hold of the throne of God, that they would wrestle and not give up, Lord, until they know that your good hand is on their family. Father, I pray, as Andrew said earlier, that the children in this church would be raised to live and to die for Christ. To live for Christ, they must first die to self. Oh God, help us as parents to die to self, to model to our children a selfless life, a life of simplicity and devotion to Christ. That our children would see that what's more important is the eternal and not the temporal. Father, I pray for the student ministry in this church. And I pray for the leaders of the student ministry, that, Lord, you would give them a holy boldness, that you would give them the courage to confront worldliness. Lord, to call the sinner's heart to repentance. That you would give them the ability, Lord, to confront evil desires, to expose the darkness, as Paul calls us to in Ephesians. That silly talk, worldly chatter and impurity, Father, would not be that which grips the hearts of the young men and women of this church, but rather truth, integrity, honesty, faithfulness, 
Lord, the things that reflect you would grip the hearts of young men and women at Hickman Church. And Father, I pray that we ourselves here would be men and women who would seek to adorn the gospel of grace with faithfulness, with perseverance, with purity, with honesty, with integrity. The Lord, all that we do and all that we say, Father, would be that which flows out of a desire to exalt, honor, and uphold the one who holds us. Lord, may Christ Jesus be the reason we live and the reason we die. May we model, may we example what it means to live for Christ. May we count the cost. And Father, we pray that you would use whatever situation we find ourselves in. Lord, whether a time of persecution where evil comes against us or a time of peace where good abounds, Father, may we see your sovereign hand working in both. May we be like Job of old who say that says the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Help us to be faithful. Help us to be faithful this week as we leave this place. Help us to honor you, to please you in everything that Christ might be exalted and given his rightful place. We pray these things in his name for his glory. Amen. Our closing song tonight is one that we've sung many times over many years here. Perhaps it has never been so fitting, so real a present. And I pray that the, uh, the focus and the resolve that we see in this song would be true of each of us um, as we live this life and, and face the things that come our way. May we indeed take up our cross, die to ourselves, and live for Christ. Please stand and sing with us as we close our time.
Isn't it? In fact, it's been quite the week, but we thank God for it, and we thank God for all that we've learned today. I want to finish this, uh, this day out with this verse. It says, for not one of us, this is Romans 14, not one of us lives for himself, and not one of us dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end... Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. We live under his sovereign lordship. And we remembered our Lord this morning and all that he accomplished for us. He has called us into this body called the church, the pillar and the support of the truth. And we must stand, and stand we will, because he is sovereign. Trust Him. Take the messages of faith you've been hearing about from Hebrews 11 and clothe yourself this week in faith. Take the message we've heard tonight and be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And if you do that, this church will be a bright light and it will be that city set on a hill and the Lord will be glorified. May that be true of our lives this week. You are dismissed.